Morning, everybody. Hey. Hey. Well, maybe good news, maybe bad news, depending on where you are. But this is our last installment on our series about called an unpopular message about uh, the signs of the times and what's going on. So, if you have your Bibles, if you want to read with me, we are going to be in Amos, that Old Testament book, Amos chapter eight, and uh, then we'll be in Second Corinthians two. So. Again, we're wrapping up our series called An Unpopular Message, and it's been a series, five, five sermons, five messages about the end times, the signs of the times that the Bible talks about. It should be an encouraging message for Christians, right? Because all these signs happen, and when they happen, we know it's the beginning of the birth pains, and soon Jesus is re to return. But for a lot of people, and especially a lot of churchgoers, I guess I won't say Christians, but a lot of churchgoers, pew sitters, people, um, it's not a good message, and this is kind of heartbreaking, and the reason it's not a good message is because it calls them out of complacency, out of spiritual laziness. It calls them to be active and ready and doers of God's Word, the Bible, and uh, there are a lot of people in churches that just honestly don't want to do that. I mean, we've had them flow in and out of Wasatch Christian Church, and they want to be here, they want all the benefits, but they don't want to serve. They don't want to live biblically. They don't want to do what the Word of God says. And so for many, this is a challenging message, and I hope if uh, there are those here, those listening online, that um, this kind of wakes them up to, be, uh, to realize that they need to be serving God actively and faithfully because the Bible tells us that when Jesus returns, he returns for the faithful. And that's where he wants to find us is alert and ready and, and doing his ministry, his work. Uh, there's a story in the New Testament uh, about in Luke chapter 17. If you want to look at it, you can. It's Luke 17, 11 to 19. It's a story about Jesus when he was doing his earthly ministry. He's walking along, and he comes across 10 lepers. Now, most of us in here remember the story. Leprosy was that disease that it literally made the, the skin and the body literally rot apart. And if you were a leper, uh, you couldn't worship. If you were a leper, you were actually cast outside of the city. Uh, if someone came near you, you had to cry out, unclean, unclean, so they wouldn't even come close to you. And anyone who was a leper was an outcast. And in good Jewish law, you could not go near a leper, and much less you could not touch a leper. Well, Jesus does something interesting in Luke 17. Not only does he go near these 10 lepers that are, quote, spiritually unclean by the Jewish law, but he goes to them and he heals them completely, mercifully, gracefully heals them completely of this horrible disease and restores them back to life and society. It is such a cool story of the power of Jesus and his love and his grace and what he can do in our, in our lives. But here's the point where we're going today as we talk about the signs of the times and Christ's return is out of 10 lepers that are healed, they start walking away. And those of you that know the story, what happens? One, only one out of ten, takes the time to turn around and walk back to Jesus and say, thank you for healing me. Only one. Now, what do the other nine do? Well, they've got their healing, their back restored to society, they've got what they've been wanting for all this time, and they just go on their merry way. They don't have time to even turn around and say, thank you. Now, that's really pretty offensive, don't you think? I mean, you think about the fact that here, literally, in our culture, say you contacted some horrible disease and, and you, you couldn't even be in the city, you're cast out, and this man, Jesus, comes and heals you, don't you think it would at least be worth a little bit of effort to say thank you? The encouragement this morning as we finish up our series on the signs of the times of Christ's return and how we should respond is this. If you're hearing this message and you've got a relationship with Jesus and salvation, be the one. Be the one that makes time to turn around and say thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your salvation. Thank you for blessing me. Thank you for bringing me into warmth and comfort and food. Thank you for watching over me through the good and the bad. Don't be so arrogant and prideful that once God blesses you, you turn and you walk away from the Savior. And that's literally what these 10 lepers did, isn't it? isn't it? Except for one. One came back to the Savior in gratitude. Nine 
just turned away from the man that healed them, Jesus, and literally didn't even look back and walked away. That's a sign of what I think our modern, modern church is like, because there are a lot of churches that just have the message, oh, Jesus loves you, and that's all there is. But the Bible is so much more than that, isn't it? It does talk about conviction and sin, and we have to take the whole context. And the Bible basically tells us that we are to praise and glory, to do the will of God, to be active. And that act activity is this, not just getting what we want and going our own way. Doing what we want, how we want to do it, and just spending our life on our terms. But as a Christian, it's about coming back to Jesus, praising him and thanking him, and then saying, Lord, what would you have me to do now? You have restored me, you have healed me, you have loved me, you have given me a gift I don't deserve. Thank you. What would you have me to do now? So if you're hearing this message, make sure you're the one. The one that turns back to the Savior and doesn't walk away, especially in this crazy world of ours. So we're finishing up our series today. We look at two things this morning about the signs of the times of Christ's return. And again, this whole series is not about having the intellect of knowing all about this stuff. It's really more about application, right? That if God gives us in the Bible for some 2,000 years, I don't want to say warnings, but this instruction about when he will send his son back, it shouldn't just be about gathering knowledge and being all heady and intellectual. It should be about saying, Lord, what would you have us to do with this knowledge? How would you have us to receive your message and apply it to our lives that we may live it out and glorify you? So the first thing we want to look at this morning is something rather interesting as we've looked through our series. And the Bible talks about in the times before Christ returns, to bring his church home, there will be a spiritual famine in the land. Now this one has always interested me when we talk about end times theology and, and the return of Christ, because if you remember just a couple of weeks ago, we talked, well actually it was last week, we talked about there was a great, in the end times there'll be a great apostasy, right? There'll be a great movement of people, like the nine lepers, walking away from Jesus, finding preachers that tell them what they want to hear, that as the Bible says, tickle their ears. They'll have a spirituality, a Christianity, a religion of their own making. And there's this great apostasy that just walks away from Jesus. And now we come to where the Bible talks about there's going to be a spiritual famine in the land. And to me, that was always interesting because how do you have a great apostasy, a great walking away from Jesus, like the nine lepers, and yet you have a spiritual hunger? Does that kind of sound weird? Almost like it contradicts, but it doesn't. We read in 2 Thessalonians 2.11 about, we looked at this a couple of weeks ago, about the fact that those who reject Jesus in lifestyle, in commitment, that in 2 Thessalonians 2.11, the Bible tells us that God literally will send a deceiving spirit upon them, that they will believe myths and lies. Now here's where the spiritual famine comes in. That if people spend their lives having a life of their own on their own terms and walking away from the Savior like the ten lepers did, the Bible tells us this deceiving spirit comes upon them. They will believe in lies and will not believe in the truth. And yet, they will have this insatiable hunger in their life for the truth. But they'll never be satisfied. Because here's the kicker. Do you know that lies never satisfy? Lies never satisfy. In fact, lies just grow and grow and grow, right? Untruth just gets worse and worse. You ever, and I know you've never done it recently because we're all good Christians here, right? Have you ever told a lie and then somebody called you on it? What do you instantly have to do? You gotta tell another lie, right? to cover the first lie, and then you tell another lie to cover that lie. And when you get into this pattern of lies, it's just this unending thing of telling lie after lie after lie. And the problem is, it's insatiable. It's just it's a hunger that continues to grow. You can't stop it until you finally come to the point of admitting the truth, right? Because it just goes on and on. You're always covering. And so lies never satisfy. And if these people that are in this great apostasy, this great walking away from the Savior, have a deceptive spirit that they can't grasp the truth, 
but they're spiritually hungry for the truth, but they're believing in lies, there won't be a spiritual famine. Does that make sense how that works together? They will hunger for the right good things. I mean, there's people doing it now. How many self-help programs and, and you know things that are on TV to help you? If you just have this, if you just do this, you'll be all fixed, right? And they just flood in, they continue, they continue. People are constantly looking for something to fill their life, to make them whole. Maybe it's another person. Maybe it's drugs, maybe it's alcohol, maybe it's, it's work, maybe it's money, maybe it's fame. Whatever it is, people are seeking for something to fill that void. As C.S. Lewis calls it, a God void in the heart that only Jesus can fill. And as they seek to fill their heart with these other things to make them happy and content and whole and complete, they have this hunger, but it's never what? never satisfied because they always need more 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 right they always need more and that's what the Bible talks about the spiritual famine in the land that people are seeking for something to make them whole and complete but they're not looking to the Savior and therefore they're never satisfied always hungry always searching but never going to the right place to be fulfilled. Amos chapter 8, Old Testament stuff. Amos 8 tells us, the old prophet gives us this prophecy. He says, Amos 8 verses 11 and 12 says this, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord. So here's God saying, I'm going to give you a heads up here. It's just so you know. Isn't it cool how God always gives us a heads up that we're not in the dark? He's like, Behold, the days are coming. And I'm telling you this, says the Lord. He says, When I will send a famine on the land, not a famine for bread or a thirst for water, but rather for the hearing of the words of the Lord. People will stagger from sea to sea and from north even to the east, and they will go to and for seeking the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. And then 2 Timothy 3, 7 tells us this about in the last days before Christ returns, the people will be lovers of money they will be uh, lovers of self they'll be disobedient and all this other stuff and then it says this there will be those that will be always learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth they're always learning they're always gathering facts and information and they know a lot about stuff they may know a lot about jesus they know about know a lot about the bible they know about, a lot about theology but they never come to the saving grace of repentance and forgiveness of sins and salvation in Jesus Christ and they're still lost so we say how could this happen how could people get this far well it's basic human nature I mean have you or I ever done anything out of selfishness been defiant just done something because this is what we want to do and we don't care what the consequences is we all do that but the Bible tells us very clearly that unless we turn to Jesus Christ, we repent of our sins, we beg God's forgiveness, and we beg his salvation, that as the Bible says, we confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, as the only begotten Son of God, we will always be seeking and never satisfied. We'll always be looking, but never finding. That's that spiritual famine that the Bible talks about. Barna is a great organization that does a lot of surveys, and it's actually said at this point, when one of its recent surveys, that in the United States alone, there is already this spiritual famine because people don't gather in fellowship, they don't seek the Lord, they don't dig into his word, and if they do open the Bible or, or crack it once in a while, they don't want to apply it. They don't want to live it. But that's what the Bible is all about. It's the gift of God, this love letter that he gives us, not just to have and put on our shelf and make it look really pretty, but it's to learn how to be more Christ-like, to apply that into our lives. This spiritual famine that the Bible talks about will come as a consequence of individual choices of people making decisions not to seek the Savior. And the story of the 10 lep lepers is so appropriate because here Jesus comes in into their midst, their outcast, 
which we before salvation were literally enemies of God, right? Rebellious, doing our own will. He comes to us, and he comes to the ten lepers, he heals them, he sheds his love and grace upon them, he heals them. And then we have the contrast of what happens. Again, nine, just literally turn and what? Walk away from the Savior. That's literally the picture. Only one realizes the gift that God has blessed him with that he didn't deserve. And he turns around and he comes back to Jesus and says, thank you. The spiritual famine is a result of people trying to fill their life with all these things except Jesus. Now here's the scary part. They may be in churches, right? How many people that are in churches, whether they're big or small like ours, how many times do you run into them and they're like, well, I just don't feel that God's blessing me or speaking to me. It's like, well, are you reading your word? Are you praying? Well, no. Are you seeking God? Well, no. Are you living what the Bible calls you to do? Well, no. Well, then why are you wondering why you're not blessed and not being satisfied, right? But people tend to want to be able to complain and talk about things, but what? Not do anything about it. They always want somebody else to fix their problem, to do it for them, to provide for them. And the Bible tells us that's not the way of godliness. Christians are to be active and doers and, and to serve others and laborers, to be seeking so that they find. It's an active lifestyle, right? It's that one leper that turns around and thanks the Savior for what he did not deserve, for that great gift, and then kind of says, Lord, what do you want me to do now? You have given me such a treasure and a new chance of life. You've literally, as the Bible talks about, made me a new creation. In thankfulness, what would you have me to do? Instead of the nine, they just said, cool, dude, got what I want. I can go do what I want. What a tragedy, isn't it? What a tragedy. Now here's the kicker in this issue of the spiritual famine. When all these people are seeking things to fill their life except for Jesus Christ, they have this tendency to blame God, don't they? Why is God punishing me? Why is he doing this to me? Why is God so mean? Well, what we have to grapple here is the accountability and the responsibility that it's not God's fault. God is there. The Bible talks Old Testament and New Testament about being able to see the handiwork, the, the, the fingerprints of God all over in creation and others and, and having the message of the gospel presented to us. It's right there. It's obvious. But if we choose to ignore it, to turn and walk the other way and seek something else to fill our life other than God, well, then the consequence of having a spiritual hunger is not God's fault, is it? It's a personal choice of not following Jesus. It's kind of like living off of processed and junk food. Who here likes processed and junk food? Mm. Oh, it tastes so good, doesn't it? I mean, it's got salt. It's got MSG. It's got sugar. It's got fat. Oh, it tastes so good. But what's the consequence of only living on processed and junk food? Well, you get fat, right? You get diabetes, you, your health goes bad, you know, all these issues. But here's the thing that science has proven about processed and junk food. You know, fast food, all this stuff. The more you eat it, what's the consequence? The more you crave it. The more you crave it. You know, there's a, a old, uh, probably about a 10-year-old uh, documentary on a guy that said that he would only go to McDonald's to eat for 30 days, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And, they, and if they said, hey, would you, like that? would you like your fries or your soda supersized? He told himself in his experiment he would have to say yes. Well, as he gets into the movie, his health starts going down. In fact, only two or three weeks into the movie, he's going to the doctor. The doctor says, you've got to quit this experiment. It is ruining your health. It is ruining, and that's only two or three weeks into it. I personally kind of like the movie because after a couple days, this guy, all he's eating is McDonald's. After a couple days, he takes a bite of the Spig Mac and he's just got to heave because his body's saying, oh, no, dude, this is bad. But he's made this promise to himself, he's got to keep eating it. 
It literally takes this man years to recover after he finishes this documentary. It wrecks his health like crazy. But all of us know when we're drinking that soda, having that, that processed food with all the sugar and salt and MSG and all the fat, it does taste good, doesn't it? But it leaves us hungry for more. It's that unsatiable appetite, right? Kind of like that spiritual famine that we're partaking spiritually of junk food and not seeking the good food, and we want more, but it never what? It never satisfies. We're never full and, oh, I don't need that anymore. We begin to crave that sugar and fat and MSG and salt. We begin to crave it, and then when we're posed with good food, you know that stuff? <laughs> Veggies, good meats, you know, salad. What do we do? <laughs> right? That's the picture, in a physical way, of the spiritual famine. That as people seek to have their ears tickled, to hear the messages they want to hear, instead of all the goodness of the Bible, the bad, the good, the conviction, the call to repentance, the challenge, the truth that says, hey, if you're a Christian, you don't live for yourself anymore because you died to yourself in salvation, and now the life you live, you live to whom? To Jesus Christ. That's the life you live in salvation. It's a package deal. So the picture is this. If we seek the spiritual junk food of constantly trying to fill our lives with these other things, we'll begin to desire them more and more, right? I mean, addiction in the United States is through the roof, right? And it doesn't matter which addiction you want to look at, they're all escalating because they get a taste of that. They don't seek Jesus. They get a taste of those things, and it seems to satisfy to taste good spiritually for a little bit, so well, let's just, what? Do it again, a little bit more. Well, it won't hurt. Well, after weeks and weeks and weeks of that, that's all they crave, all they desire, and they have no need for Jesus, right? Because Jesus is so limiting. He puts boundaries on our life. He, don't, he doesn't let me live the life I want to live. He, he tells me I shouldn't do this and I shouldn't do that, but I should do this. It's like veggies and salad and good meat, right? Suddenly, instead of being good for us because we've lived on spiritual junk food and tried to fill our life with other things than Jesus, now the message of the truth seems almost repulsive, doesn't it? just like those veggies and salad and some good meat. We don't want it. We want the junk food that we've been living off of. So you see how that spiritual hunger takes place in the end times, the days before Christ's return? Because we have filled our lives with spiritual junk food with other things other than Jesus. And now the message of the gospel is, I don't know about that. Maybe, maybe in the last 30 seconds before I die, right? And it doesn't work that way. There is a consequence for seeking to fill our life with things other than Jesus. And the price, kids, is just too high. Again, as we said before, when it comes to this issue of what you're going to feed your life on, be the one that returns to Jesus. Don't be the nine that get a gift and walk away without ever even saying thank, thank you. So what do we do with this? How do we respond? That's the whole application, right, of why we're here. We realize the issue. We understand the truth. How do we respond? Well, simply put, as we've talked about, don't fill your life with spiritual junk food. Don't seek to have your life filled, to have things that make you happy and content with things other than what Jesus talks about, right? Make yourself live on good spiritual food. Dig into the Bible, not just to read it, not just because the pastor told you to, but to look in it, and when you read it, say, Lord, what do you have for me in this time that I'm spending with you, that I'm digging into your love letter, and how would you have me to personally apply what I'm reading? How would you have me to live this out, Lord? Because you don't just give me this gift just to have. You give me this gift to apply and to live. 
So entrench yourself in God's word and prayer and surround yourself with other good, solid believers. Be in a church that teaches the truth, the good things of the gospel. Yes, Jesus does love you, but the hard things too, that he also calls you and I to constant repentance, right? And I think as a Christian, you should be more repentant than a non-Christian when they first come to salvation, right? Because a non-Christian is just kind of going along their merry way, living their own life in sin and rebellion against God until they realize that they are sinning against God. And then they repent and ask God's forgiveness and salvation. And he gives them that gift. But as a Christian, as we dig deeper into God's word, you know the one thing you realize? Oh my gosh, I'm sinning way more than I thought I was. I'm sinning like all the time. And it's a call to go back to God. And say, oh God, I beg you, you've given me salvation, now please continue to change me. Do that good work in me that you promised until I'm complete. Lord, show me how to live and, and help me to desire the truth of your word, the meat, the solid stuff, not just the milk. Help me to seek you. Be students of the Bible, basically. Be shepherds of the flock and be evangelists to the world. Don't settle for cheap, fake food Christianity. Seek to those places, those Bible readings, those Bible studies, those churches that challenge you in your faith, that don't just let you get off easy and say, hey, go in peace, God loves you, have a great week. That's part of the message. But the other question is, what is God doing in your life? How are you letting him in? Or are you hindering God? And how do you stop doing that? The Bible talks about, we read the verse in Hebrews about when Jesus is confronting these Christians in Hebrews, he's saying, why are you still, are you still drinking the milk of the word, right? It's symbolic of the simple things of Christianity. He says, by now, you should be, what, you, what is it, Christians? Teachers. You've receive this simple gift of salvation, you receive the simpleness of Christianity, if you've been diligent in faithfulness, you should have been partaking of this, and now in essence you should be eating spiritual meat, right? The hard, the meaty things of the word, really digging into the theology of what God is doing. Well, here's the picture. Now a baby eating baby food is cute. Right? I mean, they get it all over. It's all over their face, their clothes, their hands, up their nose. And we just think, oh, that's so cute. But a 50-year-old man eating baby food? That's almost on the edge of repulsive, isn't it? It's like, dude, what is wrong with you? The image is that as we are in Christ, we shouldn't just settle for the simple things, that baby food, that milk of the word. We should be seeking to eat solid food. Isn't the goal of having a baby when they're on baby food to get them to solid food? I mean, with our grandson, I tried doing that way too early because I'm like, dude, that's like pureed beef liver and peas and okra and barley. That's just nasty stuff. Let's give you some meat. Let's give you some solid food, right? Let's have some bread, some, some protein, right? And I remember when Timothy st first started eating that stuff, it was so funny to watch him eat. Because once he got away from baby food and he realized he could eat what the big adults were eating, you know what he did? He just devoured everything in sight. He just couldn't stop feeding him. And for me, that was fun because I'm a food pusher for one thing, right? You all know that. But it was cool to see him go from this pureed diet eating solid food, not only physically, but in a spiritual sense. And that's what God calls us to do. <coughs> so Christians, check yourself. Make sure that you are eating solid food, things that challenge you, things that don't just go along with what you believe, but make you think about what you believe, that make you wrestle and work out your salvation in God, that make you question yourself, am I living for God or for me? Am I letting go of that old sinful nature? Or am I embracing Jesus Christ and the new life that he's given me? Am I the one who returns to the Savior? Or am I one of the nine that walks away? Spiritual famine in the land. A sign of the times. It's epidemic. And it's horrible. 
make sure as a Christian in life application, you're not part of that epidemic, right? Okay, last one, are you ready? You had enough? Okay, last one of the day, last one of the series for now. I like this one because we don't end on a good note. We end on a great note. And here's the title of the last one we look at. The triumph, what is triumph besides a car? The victory, the winning, the overcoming, right? The winning the battle, the triumph of the gospel. God wins. The good news, the gospel message wins. Matthew 24, good verses to read, good verses to remember, New Testament stuff. Matthew 24, verses 13 to 14 <laughs> says this. Jesus himself is speaking, which should be important, right? I mean, all the Bible's good, but when we see those red letters in the Bible that Jesus is speaking, I think we should take extra note to him. And Jesus says this, but the one, notice stop there. Does Jesus say, but the many? No, he says, but the one, which again is going back to our 10 lepers that only one returned to Christ. Looking in, in Matthew and about the, the message of, of the seeds that out of all the seeds that were scattered in that, that parable, only a few actually make it, right? So Jesus says, but the one who does what? Endures, perseveres, makes it to the end, he will be saved. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached into the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So a couple things here. One, we have to make sure, like we've been saying this whole morning, we need to be what? The one. The one that returned to the Savior, not the nine that walk away. Because it's a limited amount. There are many that will hear the gospel and reject it and not live for it. There are many who will claim they are in Christ, in word, but not in lifestyle. There are only a few that Christ will come for. 2 Corinthians 2, verses 14 to 17, tell us this. I like how it starts in verse 14. But thanks be to God. Haven't we talked about returning Christ and saying thank you? The one returns and says, thank you, Lord, for saving me. Thank you, Lord, for blessing me. Thank you for the gift that I could not earn or possess and that I didn't deserve. Thank you. So verse 14, but thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifest through us a sweet aroma of knowledge of him in every place. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Simply put before verse 16, when you are in Christ, you have an impact to the world. Wherever you go, as God lives in you and moves through you, you have an impact in the world. Verse 16, to the one an aroma from death to death, death to death, to the other an aroma from life to life. Who is adequate for these things? For we are not like many peddling the word of God, but as, but as from sincerity, but from God. We speak in Christ in the sight of God. In other words, what this is saying is, as a Christian, you have that impact as you're growing and maturing in godliness. That to those who reject the Bible and reject the salvation, the morality of God, well, you become offensive, right? You're that death to death aroma because they look at you and you say, well, how dare you put your judgments upon me? How dare you impose your legalism upon me and your, your Christianity? Well, here's the good news, kids. We're off the hook because it's not us imposing anything. It's us sharing the gospel. And if they're convicted, it's because the Holy Spirit is convicting them. They're just blaming you and me. But it's really the Holy Spirit that's convicting them, right? And nobody likes to be convicted. I mean, didn't you walk in this morning going, whew, dang, looking to be convicted this morning in church. That's going to be fun. We don't walk in doing that, even though we are convicted, but it's a good conviction because it draws us back to repentance in Christ, right? So Corinthians tells us that you may be that aroma that other people think you're offensive because there's that conviction from the Holy Spirit. On the other hand, as that Spirit lives in you, to those that are truly seeking to be Christ-like and have salvation, you are that aroma from life to life. In other words, it's like, wow! 
I'm so glad you're here. Let's talk about Jesus. Let's pray. Let's do these things. Let's talk about the goodness of God and how he's blessing us. This is so cool. And you just have this spiritual bond because you are spiritual family. So you and I will have this impact because of the gospel. We'll either come across offensive because people don't want the conviction, or we'll come across as life-giving because the goodness of God through the Holy Spirit indwells with us. And as the Bible talks about, it's like a, a stream that is overflowing out of us. We just can't contain it. It's just flowing out about the goodness of God. Psalms 47.1 says this, King James Version, it says, oh, clap your hands, all you people, and shout unto God with the voice of triumph. The message of the gospel, that when we are faithful and we are ready, we are triumphant. Another word for that is what? Victorious, winners in God. We overcome. Those who are in God, who are tested and been found true, who have salvation and the only Son of God, Jesus Christ, and remain faithful will be the ones that God comes and changes in the twinkling of an eye and brings us back to heaven. So you think a Super Bowl victory party is won when your team wins? Can you wait to that party in the sky when Christ returns and takes his faithful home? I mean, I don't think we know how to party, really. I don't think they're going to have wings and popcorn or appetizers, but it's going to be an awesome party with Christ because no more sin, no more tears, no more pain, no more struggle, no more hate. But as God brings us home, we'll share in all the goodness of his glory and how he originally created things to be. And we'll be in 100% truth. And what a cool, cool thing. So as the gospel triumphs because the Bible tells us that the word of God will remain forever and will not be changed. What does the triumph of this gospel look like as we wrap up? Four things I want to throw at you. Number one, the gospel, the good news of Christ, of the salvation message, is transforming. It is transforming. In other words, it changes you. I don't think, as a pastor or even as a Christian, that you can come in contact with the gospel and not be changed one way or another. Either you choose life in Jesus Christ or you reject it and walk away. But either way, you are now different right? And when you accept salvation in Christ, the Bible talks that you are changed. Your old life is dead, as we've talked about many times. And the new life you now live, you live in Christ and for Christ. The Bible calls us a new creation. It's that transformation, that metamorphosis, the, the picture of going from a caterpillar and that metamorphosis to a butterfly. We are radically changed. We don't even look like our old selves anymore, right? The gospel message is transforming. It changes you, and all for good. And I can prove that with my wife. She'll put up with grubs, little caterpillars, but when she sees butterflies, ooh, pretty things, right? We want the pretty things. We want the butterfly because it's soaring. It's beautiful. It's, we look at that, we think, man, how could God create such beauty and such a little thing on those wings and all that stuff? Then we look back at the grub and it's just like, wow, what happened to that, right? It's that transformation that changes it. Something beautiful that's soaring, that's overcoming, that's victorious. So the gospel is transforming, right? It should change our lives. Number two, the gospel is expanding. The Bible clearly tells us that every ethnic group in the world will hear the gospel message before Christ returns. Now it doesn't tell us that they'll all accept it, but that the message of salvation will go out to all. And we know very well that's happening today, right? The message of the gospel is going out through the Operation Christmas Childs, through missionaries, through others who are striving to share that gospel message. So the gospel will expand until all the world has heard. And here's the thing I love about that. There is no force that can stop it. It can hinder it a little bit, but it can't stop it. Can jail cells and bars stop the gospel? Well, no, look at the Apostle, Apostle Paul. I mean, when he was in jail, he thought it was great because he had a captive audience to preach to. I mean, maybe that's where God's going to put me in my dream that, you know, I can preach all day long and you can't get away, right? Jail bars can't stop it. Can artillery and rifles and guns and bazookas stop it? No. Can doors stop it? 
No. Can rejection stop it? No, you can reject it, but it's still coming. The truth is still the truth, right? The gospel message is expanding until all the world has heard. Number three, the gospel transforms us into maturity, as we talked about before, right? Going from milk to solid food. If we are active in our faith, in seeking God's goodness, instead of trying to live life on our own terms, it's going to grow us and change us. You know what, as a Christian for over, what, some four, almost five decades now, I'm not perfect yet, right? She don't answer that. But I can tell you, I'm a radically different person than who I was before Christ. Because I was that cocky, arrogant person that I knew how to live life, I know how to do it on my own. And God had to wean me off of that, to dependence upon him. In every circumstance, in every place, to be able to be joyful when things are good and when things are hard. Because it calls me back to dependence on Christ. Colossians 1, if you want to turn with me there. Colossians 1, verses 9 to 12 tell us this. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, the gospel message, we have not ceased to pray for you and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Catch this, verse 10. So that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. What does it mean to walk in a manner worthy of God? Well, it means to be Christ-like, right? And to be Christ-like, we have to grow in that godliness. It says, that you, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respect, respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in, what's the Bible say? The knowledge of God. Strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints of light. This whole section in, in, in Colossians is, is about what? It's about growth. Growth in the godliness. Growth, growth in the Christ-likeness. -like being worthy of living a life pleasing to the Lord. Bearing fruit. Increasing in knowledge. Strengthened. Giving thanks. Being joyous. Learning to be patient. It's all about the characteristics of God in us. And that's what it's about, right? That's what maturity is. Having the very character of God indwelling in us and living out through our life. So the gospel transforms Christians into maturity. It strengthens us. It makes us patient, self-disciplined, overcoming, joyous, and living a life that pleases God. And fourth thing that the gospel does, if you can't tell it this morning, the gospel is energizing. It's not the caffeine. It's the gospel. The gospel is energizing. Yes, it does confront and convict of sin, but it also under, ushers in an understanding of God's greatness, of God's love, of God's forgiveness, of God's blessings. It gives us the good news of salvation. It gives us the good news of not having to worry about our future or our life because we know that our life is securely established in Jesus Christ. Not only now, but our future and our eternal future. Ever notice that a lot of people in the world are always wondering what happens after this life? Some say there's nothing. Some say, well, you're reincarnated to like a dog or a cockroach or a king or a queen or something. Others say, well, there's, you know, you'll have a chance to realize you were wrong and you can change things. The Bible says that once you die, the decision is made based on the life you've lived. But as a Christian, the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ and that salvation gives us the security of not having to worry about our future. Why? Because God's got it right here. Any of you have enough stuff to worry about already? You don't need more to worry about, right? If you've got that eternal security in Jesus Christ, that's just another thing you don't have to worry about, right? You don't have to worry about your eternal future because you know where you're going. You don't have to worry about how tomorrow turns out because God's got your future. God's got it. 
but it means God will get you through it. And when the second life in Christ is done, you'll be face to face with him in glory. I mean, that's good news, right? Shouldn't that be energizing? Y'all like good news. I mean, you know, it, it's funny to watch people go to weddings, right? Because everyone's, most people are all giddy and happy. Why? Because they're getting married. It's so cool. Well, when Christ returns and his church is united in that marriage ceremony with Jesus Christ, that's a reason to celebrate, right? I mean, very few people, and if they do show up to the wedding, people don't want to, very few people show up to the wedding going, oh, this is just horrible. I just wish they'd hate each other. Man, let's just ruin the wedding, right? Those people are cast out, right? Because it's a celebration of life, of relationship, and a hope for the future. And the gospel gives us that energizing news. It should energize us, right? It should make us happy because God's got it. We don't have to worry about it. We can just focus on pleasing God. We don't have to focus on what we're worried about, right? God says, don't worry. There's enough problems today. I'll take care of it. Don't worry about it, right? That's good news. It should energize us. So what do we do with all this? How do we apply this? Well, again, know the gospel, know the Bible, know the word of God, dig into it. Make sure you're maturing in Christ. Meditate on the word of God. And again, as we said before, when you open and you're reading the Bible, don't just read it to read it or because the pastor told you to or because you feel guilty, but read it to say, God, what do you have for me this morning, this day in, in your word? What do you want me to apply? How do you want me to live this out? Draw closer to you. Number two, preach the gospel. People are offended. Well, they're offended with God, not really with you. They're just blaming it on you, but it's God convicting them in their heart, right? It's not you. You're just the middleman. You're just the messenger. They're just ignoring the real reason. Number three, fill your mind with the teachings, the, the life of what Jesus did, what he did, who he went to see, who he talked to, how he talked to them, what he said. Because if we're to be Christ-like, we have to know how Jesus Christ lived, right? We have to know what he did. And when he talked to someone, how he spoke with them. We already know Jesus spoke with the down and out, and he spoke with royalty. He spoke with all of them. So what was his message to them? How did he respond to them? He spoke to religious leaders. He spoke to sinners. What did Jesus do with each one of those individuals? What was his message to them? Because that's what we need to emulate, right? That's what we're called to do. Here's one. Practice the love of Jesus. Now that sounds so easy, right? But really practicing love is hard. Because you got to forgive instantly. Well, that's an easy one, right? We have no problem with forgiveness, right? We don't ever bring up the past, the mistakes of the past. Practice love, the love of Christ. Forgive, serve, help, don't seek your own. Give, even sacrificially, practice the love of Christ. And finally, as we've talked about this whole series, finish strong. Stay faithful, Christian. Stay active, be on the alert, be looking for Christ to return, whether it's our generation or not. Be looking and ready, saying, Lord, if you return now, you're going to find me ready. You're going to find me ready. And be the one that always returns and seeks back to Jesus to say thank you and to look for his direction. So I pray in this series you've been challenged a little bit. Shouldn't be new news to you, but hopefully it's kind of stirred up some things to remind you to draw closer to Christ. I hope you've been blessed. And I hope we all have salvation in Jesus Christ and follow him. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you once again for your many, many blessings, for bringing us here today, for the wholeness of your word, for the, the, the victorious triumph of the gospel. Lord, again, we look forward to your return. And in the meantime, Lord, until you return, help us to remain faithful. Speak to us in our hearts and our minds of what you would have us to do, how you would have us to live in love, how you would grow us into looking like you. We thank you and praise you, pray that you would be glorified in all these things, in Jesus' name.